All right. <clears throat> so my name is David Turner, and I'm teaching this section of Computer Science and Engineering 201, Introduction to Computer Science 1. And as I just said, I'm going to uh, I'm going to try to tape all of my lectures and make those available on YouTube, so that if you miss a lecture, that uh, you can always still cover it or watch it, listen to it. And um, I'll go from there. So here's the course web page. And I maintain this page in my own uh, wiki. But uh, it's actually available through, um, through Blackboard as well. I, at least I think it is somehow here. Let's see. This is, um, this is the schedule. There we go. So that's that's the uh, that's what that website looks like through Blackboard, <coughs> and uh, I use uh, Blackboard uh, mainly for grading and um, and accepting your uh, your submissions, your work submissions, and you can use Blackboard to kind of keep on top of the schedule of activities. All right, so. I want you to uh, submit work that you do uh, through Blackboard in this class. We'll talk more about that in a minute. But let's let's talk about the um, about what we're going to cover in this uh, this quarter in this class. And basically, um, it's a it's an introductory class on the topic of computer science or the subject of computer science. And the approach is to uh, that I'm taking is to give you a sequence of programming problems to solve. And as we go through the quarter, uh, you'll you will get one programming problem to solve after another. And in fact, uh, on the quizzes, and there are three quizzes, and the final, uh, those. Uh, those exams will look like the, the lab activities and will look like the assignments. It'll be very consistent in what I'm asking you to master, what I'm asking you to understand. You'll see the, a consistency across all those different uh, graded components of the class. So the first graded component is a lab. So uh, on Monday and Wednesdays we have a lab. and. Um, you can do the lab at home or do the lab anywhere on a laptop computer or you can do the lab in the lab room at the scheduled time. So all of the instructions for the lab are online. But it does help to come to the, uh, to the, to the, to the physical lab on the third floor on either Monday or Wednesday because uh, I will be there and uh, one or two uh, teaching assistants that are working with me will be there as well and can, um, can guide you and help you solve problems as you have them. So let's think about it. What is it that you're going to learn this quarter? I'm talking a lot about uh, how we're going to go about doing the learning, but what exactly is it that you are going to learn? And I would say that, uh, of course, there are different ways of, um, of explaining that. It's not a simple way to explain it. But one term that's been, um, uh, been used in uh, recent years by educators of uh, computer science and computer engineering and bioinformatics and computer systems or information technology, there's a lot of different terms now which are very related, and, the, the, and, and, and educators have been trying to come up with some standard terminology to describe what it is, what is the subject, what, what do you need to learn, what is, the, what is this all about. It's a little different if you look at another discipline, say, like physics. Uh, physics has been around for a long time, right? So that's very standard. People know what words to use when they talk about physics as a discipline. Uh, but um, when it comes to computing or computer science or information technology, I don't know what are we going to call it, these, uh, these disciplines haven't been around for very long. 
I mean, really, there was the first computer, digital computer, or electronic computer. What I, I don't I don't remember exactly. Maybe the 1950s, 1955, or something like that. And um, so that was the beginning of electronic computing. And before that, they had they were computing devices that were mechanical in nature that didn't rely on electronics, hand crank calculating devices and things like that. And I would say that somewhere around in the 1960s and 70s, computer science as a discipline and computer engineering um, started to appear in the universities. And they, they grew out of one of two different departments. Uh, one department um, that uh, computer science grew out of is mathematics. And the other department is electrical engineering, or the other discipline. I say departments. University is organized by departments. And um, <coughs> so in some universities, you had the Department of uh, Electrical Engineering teaching courses on electronic digital computers and then creating a major. And students would elect that major, and they would graduate with that major and, uh, and find work in that major. And work has been good generally, although it's, uh, the field is very cyclical in terms of the demand for workers. But uh, since computers have um, started playing a role in society, that uh, generally it's been uh, favorable for people with computing skills to find employment. And it's still generally fav favorable right now, even in this terrible economic situation that, um, that the United States is in, that uh, still there are, um, there are people, graduates of our programs here at Cal State, who are finding employment as computer programmers or system administrators and uh, in other areas that are related to computing and that require computing knowledge. But I would say that right now in this moment, it's pretty tough to find, to find work in almost every field. It's just the nature of the moment right now. Uh, so coming back to wh what computer science is, what computing is, uh, one term that educators have started using is computational thinking. So oh, what students learn in the university when they take, say, this class is they learn computational thinking. If you were to take a math class, you're going to learn mathematical thinking. If you take a science class, you'll learn perhaps scientific thinking. So what's, what's the kind of thinking that you learn here in this class, Computer Science 201? You learn computational thinking. And um, and there's lots of debate about what is this computational thinking and different professors are arguing about the fine points and, uh, and, and, and some of them don't even understand uh, much about it at all. But I, I think there are two, two, um, two aspects of computational thinking which are, are pretty straightforward, uh, that are pretty clear to people when they talk about it, when they analyze it, what are the what's the essence of computational thinking and, and uh, information technology, I suppose, we'll say it like that. And uh, one is abstraction, the ability to, to, to do abstraction, and the other um, component is uh, automation. So you create these abstractions, and then you use automation to work with these abstractions to solve some kind of a problem. So just uh, as an example, say like um, a search engine, like Google, all right, we'll say, okay, what, what is the problem there? What is the computational problem? Well, people are going to type in search terms. They're going to hit, uh, you know, find, and, uh, and the service provider is going to generate a list of, of links to web pages that um, 
that, uh, that it thinks the user is looking for, that has the information the user is looking for. So we have this concept of a web page. So we have a web page. We're going to generate a list of uh, web page links and, uh, and, the web page ha and the we these web pages must contain information that's relevant uh, to, the, to the person searching. So it's, a, it's just a simple statement of the problem. There's these, you know, you can think of a web page. That's an abstraction. What is a web page? A web page is, I mean, you could just dig in and find uh, lots of details there. A web page is uh, so many things. Uh, but we're just going to call it a web page. So that's, that's what an abstraction is. An abstraction is simply to, uh, to create a simple a symbol, a symbol that's, uh, that, that represents uh, uh, something that's complicated, uh, but that we're going to ignore all of the details and we're just going to think of it as, uh, as, a, as a thing. And uh, let's deal with that thing. We want to generate a, a list of these things. But when we go about figuring out where to find the things and, uh, and the ones that are appropriate to the person doing the searching, then we have to uh, go inside the abstraction and say, well, you know, web pages are comprised of text and images and links and header sections and so on. And then you have to start digging into the details. But at one uh, stage of dealing with this problem, you have, you, 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 you describe the problem in very general, high level, abstract terms. And then as you proceed through the, the solution to the problem, you, you need to start uh, uh, doing, uh, uh, refining your, uh, these terms, uh, breaking them down and getting into the details and creating new lower level abstractions actually. So in fact, that's another uh, component of computational thinking that people also talk about and identify. And that is the, the presence of uh, levels of abstraction. And uh, people working on computing problems are always moving between levels of abstraction. I'll give you an example there. <coughs> In a, the, the, the example that a lot of people mention or talk about all the time is uh, network protocols. Uh, so when you send information over a network, there are, when we think about what's going on, we think in terms of the of layers of um, of systems, so on the there's the hardware system, and you have the transmission of information in the physical world somehow. So if it's a wireless device, and you have radio frequency emissions, and you're encoding ones and zeros inside that physical medium. And then there's some device on, say, two endpoints that are sensitive to that physical medium and can and to figure out what is the information, what, which, what is a zero and what is a one. I get a zero, I get a zero, now it's a one, now it's a one. And so there's that physical device that's, that's um, transforming this, that, that, that physical uh, phenomenon to data. And that's called the physical layer in networking. And then on top of the physical layer, you have the link layer. And um, the link layer is, is deals with uh, one system talking to another system. So take going from the physical layer into this, this stream of ones and zeros. And then knowing, well, where does a message start and where does a message end? And then on top of this link layer, you've got uh, another layer, and then you keep going up, and there's, you can do different kinds of layering there, but eventually you get to what's called the, um, well, you get the network layer, that's what usually described as on top of the link layer. That's where you have the MAC address on your computer. You guys have heard of the MAC address? And uh, the MAC address is transmitted on this network layer. And then the layer on top of that is the internet protocol layer. And on that layer, you've got your IP address, which is, uh, which is used. So the, the MAC address doesn't appear on the, on the IP or the, or the internet layer, but the IP address is. And on top of the IP 
layer or the internet layer, you have, um, you have the transport layer. Are you going to use TCP or you're going to use uh, a UDP or streaming media and so on that tolerates lossy data? And so that uh, when you solve pro networking problems, you need to hop around on these different layers. Say, oh, I'm working on the, on the network layer at this point, and I'm looking at, uh, at MAC addresses, and I'm trying to analyze the problem, and then we'll just hop up a level, and we're now we're looking at the, the, um, the, uh, uh, the internet layer. Actually, there's another term for it. I just don't remember it right now. I haven't talked about this in years, actually, so it's all coming out of long-term storage. <coughs> but uh, there it is, coming back to the to the, the topic I'm trying to talk about, it's uh, computational thinking. What is computational thinking? And computational, computational thinking is essentially what you're going to learn this quarter in this class. And uh, what it'll look like to you is getting a sequence of programming problems and that you need to solve those programming problems. The first lab we talk about, I talk about uh, uh, the operating system's uh, command line interface. You know, so you bring up a console window and you type in commands to this, this character-based interface and, uh, and see, see results and do things. So we're going to start on that. And, uh, but once that's done in the first, this is the first week, the first lab exercise, then we're going to start looking at uh, the C++ programming language. And we're going to stay just in that language. And we'll be solving these programming problems uh, using the C++ programming language. Oh, one more thing about the computational thinking automation. Automation is what makes the whole thing so useful. Uh, so uh, you have, like on Wall Street, I'll just pick an example. On Wall Street, Wall Street is more and more every year uh, being run by uh, programs. So rather than real traders, uh, you know, making transactions, you've got, uh, you have, you have um, financial analysts or whatever you call them, um, making high-level decisions and then translating those opinions and knowledge into automated procedures that make transactions. So maybe you have a hundred million dollars in some account, and uh, you know what it is. You've got a target. You need to make six percent return on that uh, every year, uh, because a hundred million dollars is borrowed, and you're paying five percent on the on the on the fee to borrow the money. So you're going to make one percent profit there. So you've got to make at least six percent. In, uh, in returns through your transactions. Just an artificial example here, but that's essentially what they're doing, that type of thing. So you have um, all the, 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 these f the financial markets, uh, commodity markets, commodity futures, stock markets, are all automated now. They have these uh, programmable interfaces. So you, you connect over a network, you authenticate, do some, follow some kind of a secure procedure and then you start buying and selling uh, financial instruments. And uh, that's how Wall Street is done right now. It's just uh, more and more all the time. It's, uh, and then you've got other areas where automation is, uh, is happening. Here's another example, the post office. Um, people use email now. They don't send regular letters anymore or they do very little. And the post office is running out of money. So they're cutting back, they're scaling back, they're closing down thousands of post offices, laying off lots of workers, and so on. Another area, banking and finance. There's uh, increasing levels of automation happening in, uh, in the banking industry. And uh, that, <coughs> that means the, the banks have started, uh, and, and the banks are under a lot of pressure these days too, right, because of the bad, bad uh, loans that they're holding. They have bad debt, and uh, uh, so they need to cut their costs. So they've been basically laying off workers and relying on 
automation to carry on the, the details that have to happen behind a bank. So very, s very slowly you've got you know, automation becoming, uh, just working its way into society, into, into the economy. You know, robots, robotics. And that's one of the, that's one of the realities uh, of, 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 of existence these days. And um, you know, this discipline of computing is, uh, is all about uh, uh, increasing that level of automation, improving it and building it and uh, seeing, seeing where it's going to go. You know, some people don't think it's going in a very good place, but uh, that's what's happening here. And that's what this discipline is about. It's about automation, creating abstractions, levels of abstraction, and uh, using automation to solve uh, problems, computing problems. All right, <coughs> let's take a look at the uh, syllabus. By the way, today, this is really my, my only lecture of the year. I talk about computational theory. I'm not going to give a long-winded lecture about topics, actually, as we go through the year, because I'm very problem-oriented. I'm going to be talking about the problems that all of you are trying to solve. That's essentially the, 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 the structure of the course and the, the format that it takes. But on day one, okay, on day one, I talk about the big picture. I'm not going to talk about the big picture uh, in, the, in the subsequent lectures. I might insert a few comments here and there, but I'm not going to go on and on like I am today about computational thinking and the economy or whatnot. I'm going to get you know, down to, uh, to the dirty level there and solve uh, basic uh, computing problems that you are going to be working on. Okay. All right, let's take a look at the syllabus together. And as you can see, I have office hours. They're posted here. And um, there's two lab sections, uh, Monday section, Wednesday section. And uh, yeah, you can go to the section you're assigned to. But uh, as we proceed through the year, um, you know, usually the labs are not filled and that you can switch to the other section. It's OK. If, uh, or if you want to come to two sections in one week, you can do that. And if you don't want to come at all to lab, then you can also do that and work at home. But I want to warn you that I wouldn't do that too early until you're sure that, uh, that you can handle this uh, without getting help in the context of the lab. There is a, a prerequisite, a fuzzy prerequisite for the course, and that is that um, you're you're relatively mature in terms of your mathematical knowledge and skills, and that you have some computer programming experience already. So if you don't have any programming experience, like with Visual Basic or JavaScript or, or the language that we're going to work in now, then uh, you're going to find a class to perhaps be um, very difficult. And if you're not sure about whether you're ready for this class or not, then then why don't then I suggest that you talk to me after today's lecture just to get a and I'll give you my feedback on how I think you will do um, in this course with the background that you have. And for people who are not uh, uh, ready for the course, what we do is recommend that they take um, CSE 125 uh, to get ready for this class. Let's just get you. That's a that's a way to break into the to the uh, to the skills and knowledge that you need to do well in this class, it's a way to break in a little bit to more uh, incrementally. This is the textbook, and uh, what I'm trying to do with the textbook requirement for the class is I'm I'm trying to get away from that requirement. The textbook is expensive, and um, and it's not the textbook that everybody is optimal. It's, op it's not, 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 not the right book for everybody. Oh, it's a great book, though. This is a great book. It's a fantastic book. That's why we use it. But, uh, and, uh, and we'll be basically covering the material in the first, what is it, six chapters or seven chapters, a chapter all the way up to one right before pointers. We're not going to get to the chapter on pointers. 
And uh, so essentially we're going to follow the, the material that's presented in this book. I'm searching for an alternative. Is there some kind of a free textbook alternative that students uh, can choose and, and follow that instead of paying for the book and, and doing it that way. So I'm working in that direction. I'm moving in the direction of, of becoming uh, liberated from this um, old-fashioned hard copy textbook and in favor of something that's, um, that's free on the web. But I, over the, the beginning of the summer, I did some research on this and I could not find a free alternative to all of the chapters in this book. So I, I kept it as, a, as the course text. I can find free alternatives of the material in the first couple of chapters. And I, I have notes in my web pages about that. But when it comes to the later chapters, it's, uh, I just wasn't able to find um, alternatives. But if you find them, let me know and give me uh, links and, and tell me how, how I can get those um, alternative presentations of the material that, uh, that, are, that are covered in this text. Oh, also a lot of students, maybe they come from another course where they, where, where they learned C++, maybe from a, a community college. And, uh, and you already bought an expensive textbook. And a lot of the textbooks are very similar. So um, these other books are, are substitutable for the book that, uh, that I've indicated we're using for this course. But once again, if you do have an alternative text, and, and you should show it to me, and I'll just give you my, my, my opinion about how uh, closely aligned that book is to what we're going to be doing, the sequence of of learning activities and uh, topics that we're going to cover, okay? Here's the course goals. Learn how to write programs in the C++ language. It's kind of the concrete thing you can think of as what you're going to be learning. And uh, improving computational thinking skills, that's the more general fuzzy concept of uh, what it is that you're going to be uh, accomplishing in this class. Now, just because we're working in C++ language doesn't mean that um, you can't do things in other languages. In fact, once you master computational thinking in the context of one language, it's much easier to work in any other computer language. And uh, in fact, C++ is a good language to start with. It's a difficult language. Um, and uh, once you learn that, it's a good foundation for learning many other languages, such as Java or C Sharp or Visual Basic, JavaScript, all those languages that are used in industry and that many of you are going to actually need to learn when you get work. And here's the learning objectives listed out here. And I don't want to go into details now. Of course, we're going to do these. But one topic is um, that I'm chopping and I would really like to get to, but it's just so hard to get there in the first quarter. And that is the um, to learn about uh, pointers. And a pointer is an address in uh, computer memory, and this is a very important concept, and it's the it's the chapter in the book that we don't quite get to at the at the end of the quarter. So uh, I've tried to get there before, but I've never been able to to make it. So I'm gonna I'm gonna cross it out, but I'm gonna leave it on the syllabus to to let you know that that's that's what really needs to be learned next. <coughs> also, an another. Um, Another thing that you'll be learning about here, in addition to C++, is how to use an integrated development environment. And we'll be using, uh, although it's not required for the class, um, I'll be illustrating the use of Visual Studio, which is a very popular, widely used integrated development environment. It's, a, it's like a word processor or spreadsheet. It's just an application, a graphical application 
that you use to write computer programs and then to test them and to debug them and to package them for distribution to clients or customers. And so we'll be looking at Visual Studio. <coughs> uh, in, in the labs, however, we will not use uh, Visual Studio or also Xcode. That's another IDE that's um, very popular. If you have a Macintosh computer, then you'll want to use Xcode. That's the name of the integrated development environment on um, on the um, Macintosh. For uh, people with the uh, Linux systems, then there's lots of choices there. There's, uh, I don't know, what, what are they called? Bloodshed, Dev Bloodshed, or I don't remember the names of them, but, but people come in usually with, uh, with an IDE selected that they're already familiar with and they use that in, in Linux. But on Windows, um, most people running Windows are gonna be using Visual Studio. That's a, that's a standard IDE. And I'll be illustrating that. Uh, another thing that you'll be getting a taste of in the class and some experience with, hands-on experience, is version control systems. And uh, what, what this is, this is a very important tool that software developers use uh, to work in teams. So when you're working in a team, you have to, you're, you're, you're building the same thing, right? So how do you share files? How does one person build part of the system while someone else is building another part of the system? How do you, how do, you do that efficiency, efficiently? Do you email, you know, code to each, other's, uh, to each other? And how do you uh, keep track of, you know, what is the current status of the, of the of the project. Now think about it. A, a software system. Uh, take a Windows, for instance. Let's take Win Windows operating system. It's got more than 10 million lines of code. About 10 million lines of code. So think about all the programmers that have worked on that system over so many years, and how many programmers are still working on it. How do they work together? How do they work together? Are they emailing files to each other? It's impossible. It would never, never get anything done. So they're using some kind of um, a, um, a version control system, where they have a central repository that contains the whole project, all of the source code files, the 10 million lines of, of code for, say, Windows, and uh, but typically less than that. <coughs> So you have this central repository database of some server somewhere that has the full uh, record of, of everything. And then you've got uh, individual developers who, who make a copy of it onto their local workstations. So that's called a working copy. And then they work on the working copy, make changes, and they merge their changes into the central repository. And so you've got different uh, developers writing in edits into the into the central repository. And then when you sit down to work, typically the first thing you do is you synchronize with the central repository. So you do what's called an update. And all the recent changes are, are downloaded and merged in with your local copy of the project. It's just everybody uses it. I mean, it's uh, you have to use this. In uh, most uh, most situations where you're developing software that um, there's no getting around it. You, it's, it's just like, well, I can commute to work in uh, LA by walking there or I can drive my car. I mean, you're not gonna get there if you're gonna walk. So uh, the projects are so complicated these days, uh, so many lines of code that you're just not going to get there. You're not gonna uh, make progress with, if you're not using um, some of the required tools. And a version control system is uh, has emerged as one of the required tools. So we're going to have some experience with that. In fact, what we'll do there is that you'll solve your problems on the assignments and you'll write your code into, the, into your repository. So each of you will have a repository 
and you'll be writing your solutions to the programming exercises into the repository. And then me or Jaron Willis, who is my teaching assistant, is going to help me do grading. The both of us will be checking out your work, looking at it, seeing that it builds and runs, and, uh, and then assigning a, a grade. So when you do, uh, when you do submit work, um, that, uh, and, and, and what you're submitting is going to be a program. It's going to be a program that, that I can compile and that I can run. And then I'm going to look at the program. Well, there's, if it doesn't compile, um, yeah, that's good. Then it satisfies the syntax uh, uh, criterion. It's syntactically correct. It builds. And, um, and that's one component of, the, of, the, of your grade for this um, program that you're submitting. And uh, there's a, semantic, a semantical uh, component. And that is, does, does the program do what it's supposed to do? You know, if I ask you to add 2 plus 2 and, and compute the answer, and you, uh, and you tell me that, and I run the program that says 5, then, well, no, it's not, not correct. It builds. The syntax is good. It builds. You can generate an executable and run it, but it doesn't, it doesn't, sat it doesn't solve the problem that's uh, the stated problem that it's supposed to solve. And, uh, and maybe it's only solved part of the problem. Is it complete? That's another criteria, criterion that you need to, uh, that, that will evaluate your work on. And this is a very important one. Is, it, uh, is the code that you're of, of crafted, is it readable? And uh, we'll talk more about this as we go through the class and uh, what makes something readable. It, it's like a like an English class when you you in, in the you're supposed to um, say write a an essay on what you did during summer vacation and uh, you write it up and all the information is there it's correct I submit it but <laughs> I can't read it I mean the punctuation is wrong the spelling errors the thing the grammar's not right this incomplete sentences and I, I can't understand what you're saying but you know the information is there but it's not readable. And uh, just like that, you can have a program that, that runs and runs correctly, but it's not, it's not readable. Why does it need to be readable? Well, it needs to be readable because almost all programs have to be maintained over time. Uh, there's really no programs that just sit there unchanged from, from year to year. They, they, it's, it's almost like growing a plant. You've got to keep giving it water. If you don't do that, it's, it's dead. Now, why would that be? Well, because the operating system environment is always changing. And <coughs> data formats are changing. There's always, even a, a small-scale program, there's always bugs, always. And, uh, and those bugs come up. They, they have to be fixed over time. And uh, so to, to maintain a software system, even a small program, to maintain it has to be readable. If it's not readable, it cannot be extended. You cannot find the bug. You cannot solve the, the, the error that became apparent one year later when some user started using the program for some purpose that's legitimate, but that you had never tested. So now you have to fix it. But to fix it, you've got a big, complicated set of files Lots of logic and complicated abstractions and layers of abstraction going on in there, and uh, you need to be able to I, to 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 read through it and find uh, the area that needs uh, fixing or attention. So that's fixing bugs. The other one, of course, is extending, adding more functionality. Like uh, for instance, Facebook recently it changed the way it operates, right? And people are complaining about the new user interface or whatever. Well, that's a revision. That they had to roll that out. That, that takes a very complicated program on the server side that does things, and they they have to that it has to be readable. If it's not readable, their their software engineers cannot cannot roll out the new features. 
So readability, you know, I'm, I'm on this topic for a long time because it's very important and it's usually uh, neglected by students. But uh, as, a, as a grader and a professor, I'm not going to neglect it when I see your work. So that'll be the thing that I almost, that I focus on the most. <coughs> Comprehension, do you understand the work that you submitted? That's a little bit like um, uh, plagiarism, right? So if you, if you find a solution to the problem just on the internet, I don't want you just submitting someone else's work. You, you should understand what you're submitting. But I, I want you, actually, all of you to collaborate and work together. So that's great if you work together and you solve problems or write code together. But, but all the members of the team need to comprehend what's being submitted. Don't submit as a team. Submit as an individual. But you can, in fact, submit exactly the same program as the person you wrote the code with. I'm okay with that. But both people need to understand it, you know. That, that's the point of this criterion. Well, think about this. In the real world, people work together. People write programs together. That's a very important. That's a great skill. Actually, it's hard. It's hard to work with other people because, you know, sometimes in pro programming is a, is a creative activity. And uh, a lot of times creative people, they, they kind of take possession of their ideas. Like, this is my idea. And the, the other person on the team is saying, well, well, I got an idea too, but I, I think my idea is better. And, uh, and then it's like we're very primitive. We think, well, no, my idea is better because, because it's my idea. And I don't want to even hear about the reasons that you have for your idea. So, but really, as you, as you to work uh, well with others and effectively and to build great systems that really wa run correctly, you have to work out a lot of... Um, personality problems and relationship issues to work together as a team and, and build software. So that's just coming back to why, why, how did I get off on this tangent? I like to see people work together. I like to see you collaborate and solve problems together. Of course, in the quiz, quizzes and the other exams, uh, you cannot work together. But for the assignments and the labs, uh, working together is great. Timeliness, you have to submit by the deadline. This is the distribution of grades. Reading, how do I score your reading? Well, that's just self-reported. You go on the blackboard and you click the box, yes, I read it, submit, ding. They just get automatic credit for that. And it's the same with uh, labs, I think. It's been a while since I configured blackboard. I think it's the same with the labs. You just check it off, you did it. But with assignments, you'll submit your work. You commit it into the repository and say, I finished. Then we evaluate your assignments using the criteria that I just talked about and assign a grade. And um, that's 15% of the grade. And the uh, quizzes are 30% and the final exam is 30%. Now, the, the, the reading... You have to do the reading in order to do the labs. And the labs, you know, the idea there is that the labs are, comp are, are, are programming exercises. They're, they're like puzzles. Solve the puzzle. I'll give you the, the, here's the problem, solve the problem. Use what you know from the reading to solve the problem. And in the labs, it's all about you just figuring out how to solve these kind of problems. I mean, you can solve problems already. You know, you're already solving crossword problem, problems or whatever, qu crossword puzzle problems or whatever it is. But how do you solve this new class of problems, these uh, automation problems? How do you automate these uh, um, information or data manipulation? How do you solve problems related to data manipulation or data interpretation? So in the labs, um, the idea there is I show you in lecture, I'll even show you how to do the problems, help you in the, in the labs. The, the student uh, assistants that will be in the lab will help you figure out how to do things. But the assignments, they're pretty much the same kinds of problems, but there's just a little bit more detached. Now you have to work a little bit more on your own. You can still collaborate and ask for assistance, uh, but, the, but the labs you're going to self-report on, but the assignments are going to grade. 
And then the quizzes are going to look just like the assignments. And uh, very similar questions. Some of the assignments will be a little bit more extensive so that you have some experience with larger programming problems. Uh, but uh, those will not appear on the quizzes. But most of the problems are small, short, and suitable to appear as problems in, uh, in a quiz or an exam. So the quizzes, problems that appear in the quiz will look just like the problems that you worked on in the assignments. And then the final exam just looks like a longer quiz. So it's all, I, I'm trying to make it very uh, consistent and, uh, and clear what I expect for you to, to learn and master and be capable of. So I, you won't see any surprises, I hope. Oh, the Computer Science and Engineering Club, I think they might be coming today to talk about, they said in the last 10 minutes, someone's going to show up and talk about this Computer Science and Engineering Club. And they're going to be running a, a workshop, a Linux workshop, um, one of these days that, that you might uh, benefit from. They'll probably talk about that. Are there any questions about the syllabus, how we're going to run the class? Oh, back there. Yeah. Um, it takes time, but I, I mean, I'm, I, you know, I don't think this is the most important class you'll ever take in your life. I, you know, I'm just, this is just another class. So I, I'm trying to be reasonable about it. And uh, I've taught this class before with, with more work than I'm asking this quarter. And I've cut back because I know everybody is busy. You know, some of you are working and you have other courses and you may not even be interested in the class. So uh, I think it's a reasonable amount of work. Yeah, I don't think you have to kill yourself, but I'll tell you this, so it's brain work. It's hard. And you, you want to get a good night's sleep. You want to be healthy. You know, you don't want to be fuzzed out. And you're going to have to do, and, and if you're not in a good state of mind, if you don't have, if you haven't, if you're not good at math or you just haven't developed a logical thinking style, then uh, you're going to have to work a lot more. But if you've developed a logical thinking style, you're, you're good at math or good at science and physics and or good at writing. Good at writing is good too. Good writers make good programmers. And uh, then you're going to find the course is much easier. So there's going to be a range of experiences. And that's why I talked about the prerequisite to the class. You know, if you're not ready, take another class, to take that 125 class just to, just to d get a taste of it. I've never, done, I've never written a single program on my life, so I, I don't want to jump into this class because it scares me a little bit. They're going to expect a lot. And, uh, and I, I think that I'm expecting a reasonable amount. And if I expected any less, then the courses that come after this wouldn't work for you. So I'm really preparing you for the next step. Yeah. In uh, recent times, in recent times, I would say that um, uh, 85%. Maybe something like that. That's really rough. It's not like it's not like a disaster. I mean, most students. I think uh, the result is you're gonna. You know, I assign average grades. I mean, it's just this is not a hard class. It's not an easy class. It's right in the middle. That's what I'm trying to do anyway. I'm trying to achieve that that balance. Yeah. But uh, students, and I think they fail because they they just don't come anymore. It's not like they're trying. You know, for a student that tries all the way up into the last day, comes to the labs and making an effort, I, I'm not sure if I've ever seen someone fail. Maybe there's been one or two, uh, but not every class. So if you really make an effort, if you really put the time into it, you're going to get through the class. And, I, and when I see that, when I see that level of effort from you, I'm going to be there to try to support you as much as I can. But in some cases, I, you know, some people are just way too underprepared. I try to catch them early on and, and talk to them about it. But e even if you're underprepared, 
you can you can also kind of muscle your way through the class. I mean, I've seen that. And, uh, and if you need the class, maybe you're not a computer science major, you're a math major or whatever, well, you're going to make it through the class. You can make it through the class. But you might not get an A. Any other questions? Yeah. When you try to print it? Let me try it. Oops, I didn't want to do that one. Print, I'm going to print it to a PDF file. It looks okay when I when I print it. You know, I'm using this this program called Cute PDF. So instead of a printer, that the program pretends to be a printer, it just produces a PDF document. But this is what I get. You can try try different things. I think this looks pretty good, right? Yeah, that's good. So I think you want to try some tricks there. Um, maybe you could do what I did: print it to um, a PDF document. There's a program I use called Qt PDF. It's free. And you could try that if you want to do what I just did. All right. I wonder if I'm recording. I am recording. Okay. So here's a blackboard. This is the, um, you know, there's six reading assignments. And I want you to get the reading assignments done early. So if you look at the, the schedule, this is the November 9. That's the deadline for the, the final reading assignment. So I want you to get, to get the reading done early. And, um, and once again, these are self-reporting. Once you finish the reading, go into Blackboard, check it off. And check it off before the deadline. Get full credit. I think so. Let me take a look. I think so. I, I've never done this here. Did you read chapter one of, <laughs> what, or its equivalent? Okay. But if you don't do this, you're you're not going to do the problems anyway. I don't have to check this. Yeah. Go ahead. No, I do. The quizzes are done in the in here, during the lecture period. Huh? Are written? They're written, handwritten. You use a pencil, or a pen. They do not have to be. Your answers. What I look for in the quizzes <laughs> is that <coughs> you understand the 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 concept, the logical uh, structure of uh, of the code that you write. You can get you can put syntax errors down in a quiz. I'm not going to take off for a syntax error. You forget a comma somewhere. You know, maybe if it's important, you know, maybe I'll take something off. But it doesn't, doesn't have to, the, the solutions that you present in the quiz don't have to compile. They just have to show that you, you understand things like what a conditional is. Conditional. Does that sound complicated? What a conditional is. Right. And if, look out the window. If it's raining, bring an umbrella. Else, wear sandals or whatever. Right? That's a conditional. So that's what computer programs are built using conditionals. So, you know, I say, well, write a program that uh, decides whether you know when to bring an umbrella. I mean, then then you just write that out. So it'll be something like that. Not exactly. I'm not going to ask that question. It will be more of a uh, more numerical. Like compute the compute the average of ten integers that are stored in a vector, something like that. So, but once again, the syntax doesn't have to be precise, but the logic has to be correct. Okay. 
And uh, let's take a look at the lab reports. Once again, I did this a while ago. Let me um, let me see here. I don't know if I can take my own uh, lab. Oh, there it is. So the first lab, <coughs> there's four exercises. And uh, you just say, well, yeah, did you do exercise one? Yes. Exercise two? Yes. Like that. Oh, I didn't get the four. I'm going to be honest about it. I know most people are going to say, well, yeah, you know, I'm going to do it tomorrow. So I'll just check it. No, just kidding. Don't do that. Do it today. Um, so here it gets a little tougher. Here's assignments. This is the first assignment. This, all right, let's suppose I did the first assignment. There's one, two, there's two questions on the first assignment. Let's take a look at that. This is lab one, reading two, lab two, reading three. First assignment, due October 17. So it's a while. You do a lot of practice to get up to the first assignment. This is exercise one. Write a console program. Oops, there should be that computes. I need to fix that. That computes how far a car can go on a full tank of gas and the cost per 100 miles. So you have to write uh, a program. Now this this exercise looks a lot like all the exercises you've just done on, on the first three labs. So it, maybe you're, you're thinking now, well, how would I do that? What's he talking about? Well, that's the purpose of the labs and the demonstrations in lecture. I'm going to show you how to solve these problems. I'm going to make it simple, as simple as I can. And then once you write the, once you do this program, then you need to uh, to commit. Here it is. Commit your work into your source code repository, and then log into Blackboard and fill out the and submit the assignment report. And that's here. So here is question one. Did you commit your solution to exercise one into your repository? Yes, I did. Um, yes, but here's question two. Yes, but it's a, a partial solution. And just to be honest about it. And uh, then we'll submit those. And, uh, <coughs> and now myself and my grader, Jaron Willis, will check out your work and look at it. And we're going to apply that, those criteria to it. Yeah. Is the repository in Blackboard? No. I'm going to give you information uh, later on about how to access your repository. So I will create that for you separately. Yeah. You can use Secure Shell not to access the repository, but to access the, the lab machines. Okay. And you can work from the command line Except some of the problems are graphics. I have a have a uh, use the graphical um, uh, system, so they're graphical problems. So you can't run those in Secure Shell. You can only write and run the console-based programs, the ones that have character input and output. But uh, a program that has a, a graphical window, you know, like a like a, a window with the title bar and you know, a button to close it like this. This is a this is a graphical window. Every graphical window has these these little controls up here, and it's uh, you can move it around like this. So some of the problems have you building uh, programs that run in graphical windows that will not run inside of Secure Shell because Secure Shell is is a console type connection to the a remote system. But you can still write, you can write and compile the programs from home, but you just can't test them. And then, uh, and then that's it. That's, uh, that's how you're going to go through the class. And then I'll give um, some, um, some quizzes. Uh, quiz one here. And... Um, 
and then uh, quiz two, quiz three. These later assignments, this last one in particular, is uh, is going to it will, it will be a um, a program that uh, will be a bit more lar uh, larger than uh, than the uh, previous pro programs that you'll write, and uh, will not appear probably will not appear on the final. Uh, but I, I don't remember actually, so I can't promise that right now. Oh no, no, this this is all. Uh, this could all appear on the final exam. Yeah, these are all doable uh, 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 problems. Actually, those are those are those can be done. Oh, it's optional project. That's what I did. The program that uh, I'm suggesting that you work on as a to improve your programming skills, you can do it as an optional project for extra credit. All right, and so I. That's how I that's how I solve that problem. So all of the assignments, all of the required work, they all lead up to this, to to, to building your 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 competence with um, with computational thinking and computational problem solving, and that you can demonstrate your competence uh, by solving these problems that you're going to practice on by solving those problems in the quizzes and the and the exams. And you know what, um, you know, our graduate, I know that a lot of you are not computer science majors. I know that, and I, I but sometimes I'm going to say things that are targeted for the computer science majors. Forgive me about that. Um, and, uh, and those computer science majors, and even actually the non-majors, you may end up working with, with programming anyway. You may end up writing programs later when you graduate in the context of your job. So I think the remarks I make are also relevant to you as well. Otherwise, you wouldn't need to take the class. Right? So there's always that potential that you'll need to do this type of work later on. You won't, probably won't be writing C++ programs, but you may be writing a Python script. That, that's very likely. Or some other language that, that automates something. Like you've got you have a million lines of data and you need to make some change to each of a million lines of data. You open up a million lines of data in the word processor and go in there and make the same edit over and over again. Three months later, you've made the last change. There's, there's probably hundreds of mistakes. But if you instead spent a day writing and testing a simple Python script and I run it on the million entries, you'll have no mistakes in the file and you will have finished it one day. That's what automation is about. And that's what you might end up doing, even, even if you're a math major or a business major or one of the other majors. It's, uh, it's likely that you're going to, well, not likely, but it's, uh, it's a, there's a good chance that you're going to be faced with solving problems like that, where you're going to need the skills that you're hopefully going to learn in this class to solve those problems. So I was going to say, oh yeah, on a job interview. So our students go into these job interviews, right? And what do they do? And that many times a job interview, they put you in a room and they say, okay, here's the programming problem. Go ahead and solve it. This is like a quiz in this class. Now, okay, write a function that, you know, parses a vector of integers and finds the largest number and then divides it by two, I mean, whatever, right? So they say, go ahead, do it. And then they come back an hour or two later and they say, oh, show me your solution. I mean, that's, that's, a, that, that's a very common in a job interview situation for uh, people looking for work in the software development industry. Uh, so I think what, what you're learning in this class is very practical. And that's, that's been my kind of, uh, uh, principle that I've always followed in all the years that I've been teaching. I really want to improve the, the, the knowledge and skills of the students and uh, have you find great jobs. I mean, I'm really delighted when our students, and I see some of my students that I've worked with over the years, go out into the workforce and get, get interesting work and get, uh, you know, get good paid work. You know, not always interesting, but get very good jobs. And uh, although it is tough these days, but those jobs are still there. Okay, what is the computer science club is not here yet? I think they said they were coming. Maybe they're not coming today. Maybe they're coming uh, 
Um, next, uh, next here, I'll just wait one more minute here. So let, let's just review this very quickly. We're going to wait two more minutes and then uh, see if they show up. If they're not here, then we'll break. Here's, this is actually today, in today's lab. Oh, let me t talk about that. For those who are coming to lab today, um, it starts at 1.30. And um, you can come a little late if you like, if you need to get lunch or whatever. And um, the, the first thing you're going to do is log into your account in the lab. And these are Linux computers. And um, there is this, you know, we'll tell you what your username and password is. You'll log in, and then you'll start practicing uh, with, the, um, with these exercises here uh, that are on the web. So you'll need to navigate to this web page and then start uh, going through these exercises. So these are, these are commands. Now, you can go into the lab with your laptop and turn on your laptop and do your work there. And maybe you have Macintosh and you need to work in, um, you know, OS 10. You can work in OS 10 or Windows or whatever. And also during lecture, if you have a laptop, you, bring, bring, you can bring your laptop, you can work in the lecture. And I, I think it's more efficient and, and, and better for your learning if you're working on your own machine. Now, of course, it's easy to work whenever you have time to work at home or wherever. So when you come to lab, you don't have to work in the lab machines. You can work on your own, own laptops. Um, so anyway, today you'll come into the lab, and, uh, and actually most students ultimately, um, maybe half the students just work on their personal laptops, and the other half uh, stick with the lab machines. Now, if you don't get all the work done that you need to get done in the lab, for like for instance, doing the assignments, you'll need to come in uh, during, uh, into the labs during times that they're open and, and unoccupied by another class. And there's a schedule about that. And maybe I, I shall post that, uh, that schedule there. Let me see. Here it is. Uh, lab hours. Also a help desk, you know, we've got this help desk, you've got problems in the labs, you can go to the help desk and uh, get help. This lab, JB356, this is not usually open, so we could just skip that one. But um, JB358, you can work in there, that's a Linux lab. JB359, that's where we will be today, that is also a lab with computers that have Linux installed. And these uh, times are the times the lab is open. And as you can see today, the lab is open from 8.30 in the morning till 1.30, which is the 1.30 is when our lab starts. So everyone that's in there has to clear out and let us go in there and do our work. And then uh, we work up until uh, 3.20. But the lab is still unused. It's not occupied until 5.20. So you can remain in the lab and work in there until 5.20 if you want to work on your assignments um, after the lab finishes. And also on Tuesday, if you go in Tuesday, the lab is completely open all day long. So you don't have no conflict with the class. You can go in there all day on Tuesday. It doesn't look like it's the labs are available on Saturday and Sunday, but on Friday they're available so on. Now there's another lab, JB360. Wait a minute. This is 359. JB360 three is another lab you can use, but this lab has Windows uh, installed on the computer. So here you, you could use Visual Studio, for instance, to do your work. And uh, that's it. Where is, oh, this is 358. That's a lab that resembles the lab we're going to be using. All right, Computer Science Club, not here? Okay, that's it. I'll see those who are coming to lab, in lab.